Well, we're getting close to the end of our series uh, called The Lamb, the Lion, and the Warrior King. And we're going through the book of Revelation, and we're looking at this through the lens of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus according to the first few verses of the book of Revelation. And everything that we see in the book of Revelation must be seen through the lens of Jesus Christ himself. And so today, I'm going to talk about as we get toward the end of this, really the culmination of what Jesus is doing and what his plan is for you and for me. Because at the very end, Jesus will return. And the reason this is critical to Christian faith is because this is the final step, the completion, if you will, of the gospel. And remember, the narrative of the Bible is this, that God created a good world and that man messed it up by sinning. And a curse came upon this earth because of that sin. And God sent a redeemer, a savior, through Jesus Christ. And he died on the cross for our sins. And he resurrected from the grave. He conquered death. He conquered sin for us so that we could be forgiven. But that's not the end of the story. If that's all there was to it, it, wouldn't, it would be good news, but it wouldn't be great news. But in the end, what Jesus does is he returns again, and then he sets everything back to order. He sets everything right. He brings justice. He brings uh, goodness. He restores And we see this in the book of Revelation that he culminates everything after his return as we enter into eternity. Now, next week, I'm going to finish our series and I'm going to talk about heaven, what it's going to be like in heaven. And you don't want to miss that. I think it'll be a real blessing to you. But today, we're going to talk about Jesus will return. And really, the real question in this message is, are you ready? And if you're not ready, how can you get ready for the return of Jesus? The Bible tells us that Jesus' return is imminent. In other words, it could happen at any time. And so, are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Well, let's read in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. And then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful And true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And by the way, let me just say uh, that that's referring to his death on the cross, but also the fact that he conquers his enemies. And so Jesus is a victor and has ultimately already won the victory. And so he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. John also wrote the Gospel of John and the very first words of that Gospel are, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It says, all things are made by him. Have you ever thought about this? Read the book of Genesis. Read the first three chapters of Genesis. When God created, what did he do? He spoke. It obeyed. And his word was powerful. And Jesus is the word of God. He is the the second person of the Trinity. And it is through his word, through his power, that we find things happen in our life. And when we obey the word, When we follow the word of God, we're following Jesus. And we are getting blessings on our life. He is the word of God. And at the word of his power, he conquers his enemies. At the word of his power, he forgives sin. Remember what he said on the cross? He said, it is finished. And so everything about the Bible is just absolutely amazing to me. And it all fits together like a puzzle. Jesus is the word. On his robe was written the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. Remember that 
that word which comes from his mouth is also referred to as the word of God. Uh, The Bible says the word of God is alive. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll pierce and divide thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows us, and it's through his word that he brings judgment, but it's also through his word that he brings grace. And it's through the word of God. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. That is, the rod is for the enemy. It's not for you and me. It's not for believers. It's not for Christians. It's for the enemy. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I like throwing this verse out to my friends that think that it's a sin to get a tattoo. I'm like, well, Jesus has one, all right? So uh, whatever you think about that. I wanna talk to you for a few minutes about Jesus will return. Now, when it comes to thinking about the return of Jesus Christ, there are typically three kinds of reactions. The first reaction is that of indifference. People that have indifference about the return of Jesus, they act as if, This is all there is. They really believe, whether they're atheists or not, they live like atheists. They live as if there is no God. They live as if there is no eternity. They live as if there is no life after death. They live as if Jesus doesn't exist. These are indifferent people. And it's not that these people necessarily don't believe in God and they don't necessarily believe not believe that Jesus died on the cross. It's not even that they don't believe in the Bible. The truth is, though, people that act with indifference are not ready for the return of Jesus Christ. They live like this is all there is. And if they can occasionally fit God into their schedule, that's fine. As long as it doesn't take too much time, as long as it doesn't inconvenience them, they're indifferent when it comes to living for God. And that's a huge, grave mistake in your life if you live that way. I think the the next uh, reaction about the return of Jesus Christ is an apathetic attitude. And these are people like Jesus described. He said this. He said, as it was in the days of Noah. Now, you remember the story of Noah in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, right? That God saw that it was only evil in the earth and he said he was going to destroy mankind and so he told Noah to build an ark and Noah built an ark and God sent a flood and it was a long time God gave them chance after chance after chance the Bible says that Noah preached to them about the impending doom but they ignored him and Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the coming of the son of man now what does that mean? well I believe it means that they had no time for God in their life. In other words, it says they were, Jesus said they were marrying and, and giving in marriage. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, let's kind of break that down. Is there anything wrong with eating? No, we got to eat to live. Anything wrong with drinking? Of course not. And he's not talking about drinking alcohol or getting drunk. He, he says there's no Uh, there's no time in their life for God. They're marrying. Anything wrong with marrying? Of course not. The Bible tells us that God is the one that instituted marriage uh, between Adam and Eve. Uh, Is there anything wrong in giving your children in marriage or celebrating marriage? Of course not. So what was the problem? The problem you'll note is not what they were doing, but what they were not doing. They had no time for God in their life. And so, There are some people that react to the return of Jesus Christ or about eternal matters or spiritual things like they did in the days of Noah. They just don't prioritize their relationship with God. And then I think there's another group of people that react with fear. I can remember as a boy learning that Jesus was going to come again. And I remember a preacher preaching from Revelation And quoting the verse that says, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. And he really challenged the whole church to pray that prayer every day. And I can remember as a a kid, I was probably about 13, 14 years old. And I can remember thinking to myself, Jesus, I really want you to come. 
but I don't want you to do it before I get married, all right? So, I mean, I was like, yeah, I got got to experience that before you come back. And, And there was a lot of fear in my life surrounding the return of Jesus Christ. So there are some Christians that wrongfully so fear the return of Christ. But I want to show you how that you and I can be ready for the return of Christ. What can we do? How can we live that makes our life ready for when Jesus is going to return? Let me just get this out of the way. You can't be perfect. So if you're waiting for perfection, then you're not going to make it until you get to heaven, okay? If we're talking about as a believer in Christ, you're not going to be perfect. You still have an old nature. You still sin. Some people believe that when you get saved, it's kind of like, you know, magical. It's a fairy tale. You don't have to pay your mortgage anymore. Uh, No one ever gets in front of you on your way to work. There's never a traffic jam. God sends angels into your bedroom early in the morning and gently wakes you with the sound of angels' wings flapping and and worship music. And uh, you just never have a headache. You never have a bad day. You never stub your toe. You never get disappointed. Well, if that's what you think Christianity is like, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Now, is Christianity awesome? Absolutely. Are there benefits? Absolutely incredible benefits to being a believer in Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. It's not perfect. If you're going to be uh, the kind of person that is expecting perfection, you're going to live in a constant state of disappointment. So we're not talking about perfection. But we're talking about living in a way that you're prepared. You're ready for Jesus to come again. I want to give you four thoughts. Uh, And they won't be very long. But if you're going to be ready for the return of Christ, if you're not ready, you can start by living this way and you can begin to get ready. And here's how you do it. Number one is you live with expectation. Expectation. Let me read to you from Matthew 24, verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, Jesus was talking about his return, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. We're talking about living with a holy expectation. Now, there are two ways to have expectation. And I'm afraid that there are many Christians that have the wrong kind of expectation. You ever been around one of those people that always expects something to go wrong? You you know what I'm talking about. They're not just, you know, kind of negative people. They're not just half half, uh, glass half full Uh, or half empty kind of people they're just they're always expecting something bad to happen you know Uh, you ever um, you ever go into one of those haunted houses Uh, when I was uh, a youth pastor many years ago we used to love doing Halloween events and we'd have lots of teenagers come out and we'd scare them Uh, I was telling the students Wednesday night when I was speaking to them about some of the things that I did. And I realized about halfway through my story that a lot of things that I did as a youth pastor would get me put in jail today. And the kids were just kind of looking at me like, what is wrong with you, you know? Well, you know that anticipation of something reaching out and grabbing you or you're scared. Uh, Some of you have that with a spider. You wouldn't dare touch a spider or a bug. You just are afraid to touch them, even though they're very tiny, you're afraid to touch them because you expect something bad is going to happen. Well, we had this haunted trail that uh, the kids would go through and we'd have all kinds of stuff on the trail to scare them. And it was lots of fun. And I remember that we only let them grow, go in groups of like two to four so that they'd really be scared. So we had a couple football players that were with their girlfriends and they were uh, going to go through the trail. So I snuck out into the woods and got down behind this bush next to the trail that they were walking by. They had no clue that I was there. And these big boys, football players, were walking along. Oh, this ain't scary. They're just being all brave and bold, falsely so, in front of their girlfriends. And I waited till they got right up next to where I was hiding. And I reached out and grabbed both of those boys on the ankle and screamed at the top of my, my lungs. They may still be running. I'm not quite sure. 
they left their girlfriend standing in the woods alone. Uh, and those girls were just kind of didn't know what was going on. And I was like, you know, oh, hey, Pastor Richie, how are you doing? And I'm like, good. Uh, don't date those boys because they're not going to protect you, all right? Well, some people live with expectation like that. They're always expecting something bad to happen. But you know the kind of expectation that Jesus wants us to live with is the hopeful expectation of what it's going to be like when we finally are fully restored. Do you know that the Bible teaches us that for a believer, that one day you're gonna have a resurrected body? It's gonna be perfect. There's not gonna be any flaws. There's not gonna be any pain or sickness. I, I'm still limping a little bit from the condition I had, uh, but mostly what I'm limping from right now is I injured myself by being stupid. I had a, a hole, we, we have a stucco house, and uh, we live right next to, to where they play golf uh, on this golf course, and there was a, a golf dent in my chimney in the stucco. And I knew that I needed to pay somebody to come do it, and Kim told me to pay somebody to come do it, but I'm too tight to pay somebody to come do that. And so I decided, even though I'm not fully, fully completely able to walk like I will in just a few months, I decided that I was gonna crawl out on top of my roof in a pair of loafers, nonetheless. I know, not very good planning. And so I was going to patch it myself. I got some of the stucco patch and I, I went out there with this in my hand. And so we got a really steep roof. And so I'm walking along the edge and I've got my feet on both sides of the, of the edge. And what I did not plan on was that my silly loafers were not really the right kind of footwear to wear on top of a roof. And so I began to do a split slowly and surely and painfully. And I have deep gouges in both ankles, both knees. And I sat there. It took me a few minutes to get up because I did a complete split. And I, I was at the point that I had no leverage. And, and, and my, I just couldn't push up. And so the only thing that I could do was really make the scrapes and the cuts in my knees and ankles worse as I got up. I did fix the hole, though, however. I was just going to say that, and it didn't cost me anything. So anyway, but look, some people, when it comes to uh, expectation, that's the kind of expectation they have. They just, they, they live with no hope. They live that everything's going to turn out bad. But you know the kind of expectation Jesus wants us to have, that hopeful expectation of what our life is going to be like, I'm not going to have to worry about getting scrapes and cuts when I get a resurrected body. Hallelujah. I'm not going to have to worry about looking in my closet and finding something that fits me because I ate too much recently, right? I'm not going to have to worry about any of that. It's going to be a perfect, perfect scenario. And God wants us to live with the kind of expectation that looks forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like this. You ever walk into a place that fresh bread is being baked? You ever smell that? That's one of the most wonderful smells in the world. And sometimes Kim will make bread, and uh, I come in, and I'm like, when's that going to be ready? She's like, just be patient. It'll be ready after a while when it's ready. And I come back in two minutes later. When's that going to be ready? Is it almost ready to take out of the oven? Uh, can you hurry that up, please? I, I, I want some of that bread. And she'll take it out of the oven, and she'll say, do not cut this and let it cool off first before you cut it. And everybody knows that hot bread is better than cold bread or room temperature bread. And so I wait till she goes out of the room and I get a knife and I cut it and I put butter on it and I serve Jesus and thank him as I eat that bread. You ever had that kind of expectation about something? Just the anticipation the wonder of it, the beauty of it. You want to be ready for when Jesus comes again? Live with expectation. The expectation that he is coming again and that your life is going to be forever, forever changed. Here's the second thing you do. You live with encouragement. Encouragement. Listen to Titus 2 verse 13. 
while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Now, he's talking about the return of Christ. And he says that is a wonderful day. It is a day full of hope. It is a day that is going to be incredible. You know what you need to learn to do? Live with encouragement. There's coming a day you're not going to struggle with temptation anymore. Isn't that going to be a good day? Isn't that going to be a wonderful day when you are no longer even in the presence of sin? It's going to be a wonderful day. There's coming a day where there will be no more sorrow. You're not going to lose any more loved ones. You're never going to go to a funeral again. You're never going to feel pain again. You're never going to feel loss again. There is coming a day when Jesus comes again that you are going to be filled with that wonderment, with that incredible knowledge that you are going to be with God forever. Forever. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. So what do you do? Well, my encouragement to you is to think about the return of Jesus on a regular basis. It will encourage you when you're driving to work. For those of you that have to drive into Atlanta, I'm so sorry. I know that it can be terrible. I know that your blood pressure, you're probably having to take blood pressure medication just because of your drive back and forth to work every day. It's incredible. Um, it, it is just stressful and it causes you to think things and say things that you know you shouldn't think or say as a Christian. But when you get in that circumstance, think about one day Jesus is coming again. One day there's going to be incredible hope because Jesus will come again. In those moments that you have an argument with your spouse, in those moments that you struggle with discipline with your children, when they seem to be nothing more than little rebels and they are uh, really challenging you and your authority, when you struggle at your work, when you struggle with uh, your health, when you struggle with disappointment in your family, when you struggle with depression and discouragement and emotion, you need to live with encouragement with the understanding that there is a better day coming. A better day. Now, I know I probably shouldn't say this because it was a beer commercial, but do you remember that beer commercial that said, some days are better than others? Some days are just better than others, okay? And look, there's coming a day that every day is gonna be better than the others. And so when you live with that expectation, it helps you live to be prepared for when Jesus comes again. Here's the third thing, live with engagement. We're to live with ex expectation and encouragement, but with engagement. What do I mean by that? Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, church is about fellowship and engagement. It's about fellowship, not viewership. Now, I made that up, okay? But I think there's a powerful truth in it. You can be the person that just watches, sits back, doesn't engage. You can be the fly on the wall. You can be the one that no one ever calls on. You can be the one that never does anything. You don't contribute. You don't help. And what you miss out on is this incredible fellowship that God has designed you for. You miss out. You see what happens to most of us? We believe the lies of the devil. You know what the Bible says about Satan, about the devil? It says he was a murderer from the beginning, and he's a liar and the father of lies. And in other words, it, it starts with him, and he's going to lie to you. And there are a lot of people that believe the lie. Well, I don't have time to go to church. Well, you have the same amount of time as everybody else does, 24 hours every day. Or I'm just too busy to go to church. Well, that's not true. Your priorities 
are those that you set. Well, I, you know, they just want your money down there at church. And that's not true at all. But when you do begin to give, you begin to know the truth that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I know you think, well, that's just some line that some preacher came up with. No, Jesus Christ himself said that. And you know it to be true because you know how you feel when you give your children gifts, when they're little kids, when you give them gifts on Christmas morning, you would rather give them a gift and watch them open it than receive a gift yourself. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. We believe all of these lies. Well, you know, I don't want people to know me because if they really knew me, they wouldn't like me or they wouldn't accept me. And that is not true. The Bible says we're to bear one another's burdens. And God has designed you to have this kind of fellowship. He designed you to have friendships. He's designed you to have people around you that support you and love you. He's designed you to get involved, to make a difference. Look, I I saw an interview with Denzel Washington one time. And he was talking about that giving... And doing a selfless act for someone else. He said, it's the most selfish thing I do. And that that caught my attention. I'm like, what in the world is he talking about? And he talked about how that when he gives or when he serves, he said, it is the most, he said, there's no feeling like it. He said, I I feel more joy in those moments than at any other time in my life. So it is the most selfish thing that I do. You know what he has done, he's learned the truth. And he's rejected the lie. You see, the devil tries to tell you that you cannot do this because you don't have time or you don't have the talent or if they really knew you that, you know what, they wouldn't accept you because you know what, yeah, if they really knew what you were really like, they wouldn't let you come into that church. And let me just say this. You and I, we've got to learn how to live with engagement. You see, God's not wanting this from you. Do you honestly believe that God needs your money? He owns everything. He doesn't need your money. If he needed money, he'd just like manifest it. Boom, there it is, you know. Do you think God needs you to work for him? Of course not. He doesn't need your talent. God's never uh, called the angels over. Hey, Gabriel, come over here and look. Did you hear her sing, I did that, I made her that way? Isn't that awesome? High five. He's never done that. You know why? Because he gave you the talent. He knows exactly what you have. You may not know, but he knows. He knows that the gift that he has put in your life, the gift that he has put in your hand is important and that it matters. And when you engage, you're getting ready for eternity. And that's why we have so many opportunities for you to engage. Our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our worship and tech. And and we could just go through all these opportunities. But do you know that Jesus himself said, if you do nothing but give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, you'll receive a reward for it? And so I don't think Jesus is putting a a tier system in serving. He's just saying, do something. Get involved. Become engaged. Because when you do, it makes a difference. So we're to live with expectation and encouragement and engagement. Can you tell I'm a preacher? They all begin with the same letter E, right? And then number four, and this is the final thought. Live with enthusiasm. Live with enthusiasm. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye shall see him. Enthusiasm, excitement. Jesus is coming again. And that's how you and I can stay encouraged. That's how you and I can uh, use our gifts and be ready for when he comes. Look, I've done a lot of funerals in my lifetime. I've done funerals for newborn babes. And I've done, I did one funeral for a woman that was over 100 years old. Now, no matter where it is when your time comes or if Jesus comes back during your life, no matter how old you are, we don't know when the time comes. But what I do know is this, you can be ready. Oh, there's always gonna be more you could do. Oh, there's always going to be things that we wish we had done differently. Don't live in the past. 
You can't do anything about it. All it does is discourage you. All it does is distract you. But what Jesus wants you to do is to keep your eyes on the future. In fact, I would say even more than that, he wants you to keep your eyes on right now. Right now. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Now, I pretty much expect, I know what I've got on my calendar. On Mondays, I spend all day studying and reading and praying and preparing sermons and stuff. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to get to do that tomorrow. It's possible that on the way home today that I could be in an accident. I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen, but I don't know. But here's what I do know. Even though I don't know what tomorrow holds, I know what I can do right now. I don't have the promise of tomorrow, but I do have the promise of right now. I close with this thought. When I was a kid, um, my uncle got a little, it was a wooden coin. It's around about the size of a 50 cent piece. It's made out of wood. And it had the, the word, the, the letters T-U-I-T to it, painted on it. And he said, Here, here's this, and this is something that will help you in every situation that you're in. And I looked at him like, why did you give me this? This doesn't make any sense. It's not worth anything. And, you know, being a kid and a boy uh, and a teenager, all I thought about was food. And so I was like, what could I buy with this? I can't buy anything with this. This is not good for even a candy bar. I can't get anything with this. He said, no, it, it's a to it. I said, what's a to it? He said, well, you've always said, if I, I'm going to do so and so when I get around to it. He said, and now you've got around to it. And so you have no excuse for delaying or uh, waiting for anything because now you've got around to it and you can do it. Can I just say this? You know what God, you know what Jesus has done for every one of us? He's given us around to it. He's given us a sense of urgency, the moment. He's given us now. You may not have tomorrow. But you got a round to it for right now. You got it for right now. And so do it. Don't wait. Invite someone to church today. Make a decision that you're going to go through the next step class next Sunday. Make that decision today. Make the decision that you're going to begin to give today. Make that decision that you're going to quit that bad habit and do it today. God wants you to deal with now because now is all you have. Heavenly Father, help us to live with this sense of urgency and expectation and excitement that Jesus is coming again. And Lord, help us to be ready. Before I finish my prayer, let's just keep our heads bowed for a minute. And for those of you online, let me just say this. The number one way to be ready for Jesus to come again is to be saved, to receive Christ. And so today, if you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, I would invite you to invite him into your life, to say yes to him. You know the gospel. Jesus died for your sins to redeem you and make you right with, the, with God. And all you got to do, you don't have to earn it. In fact, you can't earn it. It's freely given. All you got to do is ask. And so today, you can say, Jesus, I want you to save me today, right now. Do it now. Online, please check at the bottom, and you can fill out the next step card, and you can check on there that you receive Christ today, and we'll follow up with you. In the room, take your next step card and put your name on it, and check that you pray to receive Christ today as well. I think here's the second thing that you can do the second most important thing you can do number one to be ready for Jesus to come again is to be saved number two is invite your friends and your family and your loved ones and your neighbors and the people that you care for invite them to come to church so they too can be ready and so there may be some of you that it's been a long time since you invited anybody would you make the decision today that you're going to invite somebody this week. You're going to invite a friend, a family member, a neighbor. 
because all you've got is now. And maybe you'd say, well, pastor, I need to begin to serve. Well, you can be involved. If you've not been through the next step class, come next Sunday. We'll show you where to go. If you want to get baptized, sign up. We'll get you baptized the next time we have baptism. You want to get engaged in a small group? Come see me after the service today. We'll get you connected. And so today is the day. Today is the day. You want to be ready when Jesus comes? Well, you don't know when it is and neither do I. Could be today. So get ready. Father, as we continue in our prayer, help us to be ready to serve you. Help us to be ready to make a difference. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.